And welcome to Kingdom Culture. You may take a seat. So glad you're with us this morning. So great to see you this morning. What a season. You know, we, we've been talking for a long time now about how we are in. It's not a time, and I know this is counterproductive, counterintuitive to what I just said, and it counteracts what I just said, but we're not in a time of peace. We're in a time of war. Now I'm talking about spiritually, where we have to war. Even when you, you're called to war for your peace. You're called to war for the thing that God's called you to live in. Peace is the fruit of the Spirit. You need to war for the things that you are called to produce in life. You're called to produce peace as a fruit. Galatians chapter 5. You're called to produce joy. You're called to produce kindness, gentleness. These things you have to war for. How do you war for them? Stay connected to the one who produces the fruit. Stay connected to the vine himself, Jesus Christ himself. Stay tapped in, connected. That's one of the ways we war. You know, John chapter 15, verse 15, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing, but now I call you friends. The verse before that says, you're a friend of mine if you do whatever I command you. We have to learn this part of our relationship with God in this season. Doing whatever he commands us to do is a huge part of us growing in our relationship with him. You know that God wants to shut you up. God wants to muzzle you. You know that. God is so happy when you go to work every day. Or not God, sorry. The devil is so happy when you go to work every day and you never share your faith with anybody. Ever. The devil loves it. He loves it. Go to work every day, 9 to 5, do your thing. Never talk about your relationship with Jesus to anybody. The devil is applauding you. You are a non-threat. We have one more non-threat that goes to church. That's what he says. That kind of sucks, doesn't it? He wants to shut you up. He wants to shut you down. I had a dream last night, really, really profound dream last night, and I saw in the dream... The strategy of the enemy. Now, I've had multiple encounters over the years where I've had this type of a thing take place. How many know it's actually important to see the enemy's strategy? The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The enemy, in the form of sin, is crouching at your door, the Bible says. Just waiting for a crack to get in. The enemy is trying to get at you. Maybe he's already got you. I don't know. But to know where he's trying to attack allows us to position ourselves in wisdom to counteract that attack. Are you here this morning? He's trying to take you out. Trying to take out your marriage, take out your relationships, trying to remove you from your job. He's trying to do all kinds of things to discourage you, cause hopelessness. And in this dream, I saw the strategy of the enemy. Like I, I knew what he was doing, and I was actually, I exposed it in my dream, and all these people got super upset, and I knew, I knew, I, I, without going into all the dream, how many would like to be a part of a dream webinar, where you learn about dreams? We're, we're going to do that in the fall, but uh, I, uh, actually it might be in the spring, I'm still contemplating, but we're going to do a dream webinar on this, but I, I had this, um, this ability to expose the enemy's strategy in the dream, and I remember, like, in the dream, it was so profound because I was in this room with what felt like, it felt like, um, like who Jean works for, kind of, actually. <laughs> it felt like the CIA, and he doesn't work for the CIA. And it felt like the CIA, and I was being questioned. I was called into question because I knew the strategy. I knew the enemy's strategy, and they were afraid that I was going to expose the strategy. And they were asking me questions like, have you been in the White House? Have you been in government? Have you been here? Have you been here? Because we're afraid that you're going to give them spiritual counsel, and it's going to thwart our plans. This is why I say the enemy wants to shut you up, because the enemy is so scared of you actually speaking into these environments in society because he knows he'll lose power and authority when you speak as the body of Christ in these areas of society. So if he can get you to go to work, if the enemy can get you to go to work and never, never bring the kingdom, guess what? We lose society. Society hangs in the balance 
on the ability for the body of Christ to rise up into her true form, to influence. Society is waiting for you to be who you were called to be. And I remember f- feeling this fear from this. I was being interviewed and questioned this fear from this individual. Like, if you get into the White House, if you get into Parliament, if you get into these places of society, the enemy, our strategy won't win. And I want to encourage you, I implore you in this moment to make it your objective in this season. I don't care what kind of job you have. I don't care if it's family, if it's you're an at-home mom, an at-home dad, whatever it is, to do whatever you can to ask God to say, how can I bring the kingdom into the environment that you've entrusted me with? That is your quest. It's not about, listen, it's not about the number one position ever. It's not about Trudeau. It's not about President Biden. It's not about the one guy. It's about who surrounds them and who has their ear. Read the Bible. Joseph was second to Pharaoh. He was raised up second to Pharaoh. Daniel. All these guys that were raised up in the midst of adversity, it was more about who who they had to listen to them than it was about just the one guy at the top. We need to be praying... I'm not saying less, but in a sense, less about the change of power and more about who comes in around those people. Because unless something crazy happens, you got four years minimum to deal with the one guy. So we're praying for people to come in and actually use their voice of influence in these environments. That's what God wants to do in and through you. I encourage you to be that in this season of your life. I encourage you to walk in that in this season of your life. And I want to talk about this morning, and we'll see how this goes, a prophet named Isaiah. And I'm going to jump to Peter, but I'm going to start with Isaiah. Everyone say Isaiah. Isaiah was a a, a prophet, and he uh, lived during the reign of four kings. And uh, he was the one in Isaiah chapter 7 who prophesied the virgin birth. And it was a dual, it had a dual meaning, um, and we'll get into that if we have time a little later. But he prophesied the, the virgin birth, and uh, most scholars say he probably, um, you know, lived as a prophet for at least 60 years. And he functioned as a prophet. Now, if you know anything about the book of Isaiah, it's a very, very important book, and it speaks loudly towards the messianic rule of Jesus. It speaks loudly about the Messiah, Jesus coming. Many prophecies have already been fulfilled from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's ministry began when the northern kingdom of Israel was on the brink of collapse. And so he starts his whole ministry in a place of dysfunction. He starts his whole ministry in a place of what feels like darkness and chaos and divide. This is how he began. How many would like to begin like that? One man wants to begin in chaos. Isaiah was considered a major prophet. We have in Scripture uh, five major prophetic books. Five major prophetic books. Isaiah is one of them. He's considered a major prophet. His book is a major prophet. Jeremiah, Lamentations, which was also written by the prophet Jeremiah. Okay, we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Five major prophets in the Bible. The reason why they're called major is not because they're more authoritative, not because they're more powerful, not because they had amazing prophecies. It's because the books are longer. Okay? These letters, these books are longer. Now we have 12, we have 12 minor prophets. Guys like Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. In Judaism, these are one book, considered the 12, one book. We call them 12 minor prophets because the books are shorter, okay? So the reason why I'm sharing all this is because we have to get a hold of and a heart for understanding not only biblical prophecy, That's why we pray for Israel, because what happens to Israel happens to the whole world, affects the whole world. 
It's of biblical proportions. We have to get a hold of biblical prophecy, understand the role. But also, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, to pursue love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Prophecy is considered a greater gift in Scripture. Nothing greater than love, of course, but a greater gift when you list the twelve. Paul says, pursue love and desire, and especially that you may prophesy. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, that prophecy is for the encouragement, strength, and comfort of all men. When he give, gives instructions uh, for, for, uh, the, to the Corinthians when there's like de- division and chaos, he said, listen, let the prophets speak. Let the prophets stand up. You know, there are still prophets today. Let the prophets stand up. Let the prophets speak. It's funny how people can recognize a pastor, but not recognize a prophet. Somehow, Ephesians 4.11, they, they removed apostles, prophets, you know, out of the equation. It's okay. You know, people are comfortable with a, an evangelist. People are comfortable with a, pro, uh, with a, a pastor. People are com- comfortable with a teacher. But you say apostle and prophet, they're like, ooh. We're not cessationists in this church. I believe the gifts. We believe the gifts are still active today. We believe in the fivefold ministry offices. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And those offices, those callings will exist until the body comes into maturity. That's what it says. They exist to train and equip the body until unity and faith and maturity come into play. We're actually going to do a whole series on this coming up really soon. But Isaiah is an important prophet that we still are living the, 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 the fruit of, from the fruit of today as, we, as it pertains to Scripture, as it pertains to our spiritual life. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 to 10 says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. In some translations it would say it like, and my purpose will be fulfilled. God knows the end from the beginning. This is why it's so important because prophecy, outside of just encouraging, strengthening, and comforting, is also predictive. To know the end from the beginning. To know what's coming. What's coming. If I start here, to have understanding of what's coming is to be predictive in nature, is to be prophetic in nature. We need to understand this stuff. We need to get a hold of this. It's one of the most important things you can do in your quest, in your relationship with God, is recognize the voice of God in your life. And God speaks to the future. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything in between. Imagine having God's blueprint in every season, in every hard season. I can honestly say on this platform, 90%, 90% of the major crises that I have faced in my life I saw before it happened. I can honestly say that a very, very small fraction I was surprised by. Very small fraction. Because I've continued to position myself, whether it's in my dream life, whether it's in my everyday life, say, God, what are you saying? And because I've done that, I've opened myself up to see what will happen at some point. Now, I'm nothing special. I'm just willing to position myself. Now, I may have a different responsibility, different gift, and different calling than you do, but you as the body of Christ have the same ability to hear God in much of the same way. You, you, but you have to position yourself. You can't come to church, expect someone to spoon feed you, and that's all you need for the week. You have to eat during the week. You got to eat during the week. You got to take your supplements. You got to work out. I can't work out for you. How many would love that? Someone else go to the gym for me. Man, I would love that. I hate going to the gym. But I go to the gym four to six times a week. I hate going to the gym. I like the result. I like how I feel. But how many like actually the process? I mean, I don't know anybody really likes the process. And then the eating. When I was competing, I was like, man, seven meals a day. Uh, It was like complicated. Meal prep was brutal. But I like the results. I like how I felt. But I hate the process. Most people hate the process. They despise the process. They want the future. They want the end result, but they don't want the process. 
But man, if we could get a revelation of the future, of what's coming, we will be able to handle the process a lot different. This is why prophecy is so important. If I know what's coming, and I know that along the way of what's coming, there's going to be X, Y, Z, I can position myself to navigate some of these challenges. Are you hearing, are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? Some of you are hearing what I'm saying this morning. God knows the end from the beginning. Now, I know, you know, uh, we're doing a fast in this season, and I'd encourage you to join us if you haven't already. Now, I have to say this just as a little bit of um, encouragement. Like, the, the, the main focus is what God wants to do in our house. The main focus is the strength in our community, the strength over all the areas of our community. And we are also positioning ourselves to say, God, like, we are going to step out and just contend a little bit more aggressively for a building. Now, I told you last week that I had a very, very important meeting on Tuesday. And um, it's funny because I shared, I shared this dream that I had at the beginning of this message regarding God wants to muzzle you. Like, I, I'm a firm believer, and I lived this out, like, that God wants the kingdom to infiltrate every part of the marketplace. Like, I'm going tomorrow morning into... Uh, a, a brokerage across our city and they're bringing me in to literally pray and prophesy over the business and over their unbelieving staff. It's tomorrow morning. Like I, I, this is, I, I live for this stuff. How can I be a bridge to the kingdom to people around me? I live for this stuff. Whether it's in education, whether it's in family, whatever, whatever environment you are in, guys, God has not put you there so that you can be muzzled. You're like, well, I'm not allowed to speak. No. You've submitted and surrendered to a control mechanism. You are allowed to speak because God's given you a mouth. You have to learn strategy of how to speak. Daniel had to actually dress up like Babylon as a part of his role to influence Babylon. He couldn't just wear his Jewish boy clothes. He was in exile, living in Babylon, under Babylonian rule. He had to learn the literature of the Babylonians. He had to do things that were outside of his grid. But God, because of his faithfulness, trustworthiness, and consistency, had a prayer life. He found strategy on how to influence those around him that didn't believe what he believed. He learned the language of the culture to reach the culture. That's exactly in John 5 what Jesus did. With the Samaritan at the well, John 4. He literally, he reached the Samaritan at the well who had five husbands with the language of the moment. You have to reconfigure your language if you're going to be an influence in society. You hear what I'm saying? Hopefully this is landing on fertile soil. But I had this, I had this, uh, this, this experience. Now this message this morning, and I have to just... I, I, I really wrestled with this this week. Last week was very different. If you weren't la here last week, please listen to it. We, it was more of a teaching. We, we really broke down Acts chapter 3 and 4 on why miracles matter. Very, very powerful message for the season. This I'm, is going to be a little bit more prophetic in nature this morning. I'm going to share some stuff, share some stories, but, and see where we get. But I had this dream. Before, actually, before I had this dream, sorry. Before I had this dream... On, Tuesday, on Monday night, I had a meeting with a developer. I had a meeting with a, an, a, a commercial uh, agent. And we were meeting with this building, to do with this building. Now, this is a building that we've been trying to buy for 13 years. I have, like, PTSD from this building. Pastoral trauma stress syndrome. Literally. Like, I don't even want to put hope in it. But, I, you know, sometimes we don't want to put hope in things when we've had hopelessness. But here's what I, I realized over the course of my life, spiritually speaking. I'd rather put hope and be discouraged in something than put hope in nothing. So put hope and potentially be discouraged again and feel hopeless again. Or put hope in nothing. Well, what's, what's, the, what's the better of two evils? To me, putting hope in something. Right? So we meant 13 years. I mean, we had architectural blueprints drawn up. We had engineers. I mean, we had a four-phase plan. We put six offers 
on a property, the same property, within a 13-year window. The last time was in 2018 with this same building. Now it comes around again, literally six years later. And I, in my mind, I'm like, heck no. But in my spirit, I'm like, how could I say no if it's still potentially waiting for me? I'd rather try failing, look like an idiot, lose reputation, my whole community lose trust in, lose, lose trusts in their leader and their pastor. I'd rather break reputation and lose trust from people than to live in regret that I didn't try when something represented itself that I felt a long time ago was ours. This is a word for some of you because you've been through stuff like this. I mean, I don't, like, it's funny because it's on St. Joseph, and I'm like, man, I'm like, I don't want to be like Joseph who waited 20 years. I mean, we're 13 years in. That's seven more years left. I don't want, so, I don't want that to be prophetic. I don't want 20 years of this. But I'll take it if that's the way it's supposed to be. At the end of the day, Monday night, I told these guys I had a meeting, and I said to them, I said, uh, and I don't, I don't really care like where they were at and their perspective on this because a lot of people don't, don't, don't bring the kingdom into their workplace like this. So I said, guys, we're going to pray on this call right now that one of us is going to have a dream tonight about the meeting tomorrow. And so I went to bed, and um, before I went to bed, I said to God, I'm like, you know, if you don't give me a dream, at least give me a word. Okay, now, I, I'm, let, let me just, I, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm very hesitant right now because I'm processing in my mind how I'm sharing this right now to you because this is not, like I said, a teaching. This is very different. I felt that I was supposed to share this and, and do a little different this morning. Hope that's okay. I went to bed and I said, God, if, if you don't give me a dream, give me a word. Now, back in early 2000s, everywhere I went, because that, at that time, one of the main things I was doing here locally is I was bringing hundreds of people on the street uh, to do, per, like, prophetic evangelism. Like, hundreds of people. I had schools and people would go through my school and we'd go onto the street. Some of you would probably remember some of that. And in the beginning, some of you even met your spouse in that. And uh, I, I, we used to do this all the time. I, we did it around the world, actually. We did it at Mardi Gras. We did it around the world. And that was one of the main things that we did in the beginning, outreach, outreach, outreach to the homeless. And we'd go into the coffee shops, into the bars, into the clubs. Like, this is what we did. And uh, we'd mobilize people on the street. And I always said out loud, I said, my, my vision and, like, my dream is to mobilize 1,000 people in the marketplace in Ottawa. A thousand people. Always said that. And I don't know why I just said it. I, I don't know if it was like a God vision. I just know it was something that was just innate. It was in me. I want to see a thousand. Imagine a thousand people, leaders influencing their environment in our city. What would happen? In, in the political space, in the media space, the business space, the real estate space, in the educational space, in the arts and entertainment space, right? Imagine the family unit. Like imagine... What would take, I mean, actually influencing, not just churchgoers, but I mean like people that are trained and equipped to be like Daniel in society and influence for 60 years long term. Imagine what would happen. Where like kingdom stuff is happening and God is shifting the mindset. That was my, that was my vision. It definitely was not like, uh, I never thought I'd ever be a pastor, like a pastor leading a local community. That was my vision. So anyways, I, I say all that to say is that when I was going to bed on Monday night, and I said, God, if I don't get a dream, give me a word, I opened my Bible to the book of Isaiah. Now, I don't play biblical roulette like this a lot. This is not what I do. But it happens where God, you know, you'll open your Bible and God will speak to you. Very, something very clear. It will stand off. It will jump off off the page. You can't do that as a methodology because sometimes you'll open up the Bible and it'll be like, God said, sacrifice your son. Like, you know... You just don't do that. But I open up the Bible in Isaiah, chapter, in Isaiah, and my eyes locked into Isaiah 60. 
the very, very last verse, the closing of that chapter in verse 22, and this is what it read. The smallest family will become a thousand people. And the tiniest group will become a mighty nation. And then this jumped out at me. At the right time, say this with me, at the right time, I, the Lord, will make it happen. It literally jumped off the page. And I'm like, man, I'm like, whoa. And immediately my mind went like back to the 2000s. I'm like, wow, I feel like that's us right now. Did you hear that? Should I read it again? The smallest family will become a thousand people. And the tiniest group will become a mighty nation. But there's a but. There's a space in between that word, nation, and the next part of the phrase. It's at the right time. When is the right time? I have no idea when the right time is. (laughs) And nobody does. That's the beauty. And when God gives you a prediction of something, you just know that there is going to be time in between that prediction happening from when you get it. At the right time. And all of a sudden, and this is what that that verse means, I, the Lord, will make it happen. All of a sudden, I will make haste. Like, it will happen quickly. Like, it didn't happen for 13 years. It didn't happen for 20 years, Joseph. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're second to Pharaoh, and your dream is fulfilled that you had when you were 17 years old. This is what happened to Joseph. He has a dream as a 17-year-old boy. Over 20 years later now, and finally that dream manifests at the right time. I had to take you, Joseph, through all these ups and downs, through this whole process to get you ready so you could handle, you could handle holding the dream that I put in your heart at the right time. Man, this really hit me. This really hit me. You know, this fast is, is not just, I was teaching my kids this because I'm like, you know, at first they're like, oh, I fasted. I'm like, well, what, when, when did you pray? And I'm like, well, I didn't. It's like, what's the point of fasting? You, you sacrifice something you value for something you value more. That's what fasting is. You sacrifice something you value for something you value more. I value prayer more. I need to eat, but I value prayer more. And it's obviously for a short time. You can't live like that forever, right? You, you sacrifice for a moment something you value so for something you value more. And so for some of us, that's social media. For some of you, it's like you're addicted to Netflix. I don't know what it is, like video games or whatever it is for you. It's sacrificing something that's occupying your time so you can align yourself with heaven. Let me just tell you, when I, when, when I am in my best space, and I'm letting you into my personal life, when I feel like I am in my best spiritual space in discipline, my, my gift explodes. My gift explodes. My dream life goes to another level. If I'm discouraged and I'm letting that discouragement hold me down, man, it's like my dream life stops. So fasting is like, kick-starting again what maybe has been dull for you. If you're, like, bored, if you're struggling, if you're hopeless, you're discouraged, you're like, I just, I need something, then you need to maybe fast. You need to change. What did, what, there was a guy, a very smart guy that once said a long time ago, if you do the same thing over and over again and you expect different results, you are insane. The definition of insanity. Who was that smart guy? Anybody know? The same thing over and over again, and you expect different results, you're insane. So change, like reposition yourself and do something you've never done before. If you are sick and tired of how you feel in your body, go to the gym. Eat better. Now, some of you say, well, you don't know. I have all these other issues. Well, I get it. There's obviously exceptions to that. There's, you know, hormonal stuff that you may have to get checked, and I get that there's healing that has to happen in some other areas of your body, but you can still start somewhere. You can still make headway. Don't just sit on your couch expecting for yourself to get better. Like, do something. Move your body. Move, right? I mean, we, uh, I think we understand this from that vantage point, but why don't we apply that to our spiritual life? 
If you want some sort of different results, spiritually speaking, you've got to do something different. At the right time, everything came into order. Everything shifted. The question is, like I said always, is is it the right time? And I, I pray that this statement would be of comfort and protection to you. Comfort that his promises will take place and protection against discouragement and hopelessness. If we can get this statement at the right time, I believe it will hold us strong. There is an at the right time moment for you to break through in your relationships. At the right time moment for you for the thing that you've been praying for over and over again to happen. There's an at the right time moment for that sickness or whatever it is to be, you know, uh, to leave your body. There's an at the right time moment. We don't know what that time is always, but you're called to pray. I don't know when the building's going to come, but I'm called to pray. So I have this word. I go to bed, and then I have a dream last night, that night of the meeting I'm going to have the next day. And I go into the meeting room, and I see the guy. Now, I've never met the guy. I don't know what he looks like. never met the guy before. I go into the meeting room, and I see the guy. And in the room, I'm appealing to his humanity. And I knew there was, I was, I was like weeping in the dream. And I knew I was to prophesy over this guy. Now, this is the guy, I'm not going to use names here, but this is the guy who is the director of a major corporation for all their land acquisitions in all of Canada, based out of Toronto. So I go into this dream, and I'm like prophesying over this guy, and in the dream, I could see him. He was this massive guy, and, you know, and I knew that it was symbolic of, of who he was, his influence, his decision-making power. And uh, I felt the Lord say to me, like, in the draw was in the dream, like, you need to appeal to his humanity. Speak to the heart. And um, in the dream, he told me, he said, we need to have a second meeting. He told me that through a situation that happened in the dream, which I interpreted as that, because that's how dreams work. God will tell you things based upon the interpretation of the dream, even while you're in the dream. And uh, I won't tell you the whole, all the details of the dream, but I came out of this dream super impacted. So I knew, I knew, and I told the guys, listen, I had the dream. I don't know if you guys had a dream. I had a dream. But I just knew that this was going to be an interesting conversation. So we go to the meeting. It's an hour-long meeting. The first little part of it, I'm like, listen, I'm like, you know, we as a culture, you know, we have put hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into our community in missions and benevolent and humanitarian in this city over the last decade. And I'm like, you know, this building has sat empty for 14 years. I'm like, you could have done so much more with this building. I'm like, you guys, I know you're charitable. I know you, you have a love for humanitarian stuff. You could do so much more with this building. They're trying to you know, right now rezone it so that they can sell it to a developer to get double the price. So here I am trying to basically convince them not to do that. And why not to do that? I'm appealing to his event. I could feel the, the wall. I could feel the roadblocks. I could feel the barrier while I was doing this. I could feel it. But then he says to me, we should have a second meeting. So that was my open door for the dream. We should have a second meeting three to six months from now. He told me that. So I went for it. You got to find the open door. How many know that in, in your, your life, life is all about looking for the open door? Where's the open door? You're having a conversation with your spouse, your friend, you know, your coworker. You have something to say, look for the open door. When you find the right timing, you'll make the right impact. Timing is everything. Remember, it's at the right time. Timing is everything. At the right time. And so I went for it, and I, I, um, I said, well, actually, I had a dream last night. And uh, you actually, we actually decided that we were going to have a second meeting. And so then I went for it and I began to prophesy over him. Now, you could tell he was shocked. It shifted the whole conversation. It shifted the whole thing. Even the guys that were on the calls, like, we've never seen this before. This kind of a meeting. Like, it was awesome. It was amazing. But I left that meeting feeling like, hey, we're, we're moving forward in this process. It's happening during the fast. Let me just tell you that. This is happening during the fast. I don't know what's going to happen after the fast. I don't know what's going to happen three to six months from now, but we're still knocking. Now, this may not be super encouraging for you, but it's encouraging for me. And we're going to keep on knocking and keep on moving until the door is either shut or opened. Amen? 
Amen. At the right time. It's like, think about it like dominoes. Everything kind of comes into order. And it says here, at the last part of this verse, the Lord will make it happen. The Lord is always the key factor, always the key factor in every scenario and situation. Are you letting him be the author and finisher of your story, or are you taking matters into your own hands? Let me just tell you, because this process for me, and, and like, and for some of you that have been involved in this process with us over 13 years, like, it, it's always kind of been in the Lord's hands because we've done our due diligence, we've done our responsibility, we've done our stewardship of this process, and it's like the door hasn't opened. And I don't know why. I just don't know why. But we're part of a story. We're all being woven into a story here. You know that. We're all being woven into a story as a community, but also your own life. Your own life has a story. God knows the end from the beginning, and your whole life, you're, you're carrying out that story. You exist within that story. How you navigate your own story will determine how quick you get to the end game. Israel walked around for 40, 40 years. They didn't have to. They could have made it potentially in 10 days. I mean, they didn't have to 40 years. I mean, you don't have to keep walking around the same thing. You might just have to get into the Word. What does the Word say about your situation? The Lord is always the key factor here. Are you okay? Our quest with God is to attain, to apprehend, and to experience all that He has promised us. This is the quest that we all have. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Like, this should remind us that when God gives us a word of promise, it's only a matter of time. It's at the right time it will happen. So hang on. Don't give in. Don't give up. The Bible that you read, this book, is a book of promises and prophecies. You know that. Why is it that, there's two things. I mean, I talked about this last week, tongues being one of the most controversial things it seems like in the, in the church at large, in a lot of circles anyways. And prophecy. Prophecy is attacked all the time. I'm actually speaking in two different cities this week in Alberta, and one of them is at a, at a conference called the Prophetic Summit. Prophecy is one of the most controversial things in this hour. Everyone's so worried about false prophecies and false prophets. You know what you should be more worried about? It's what it says in James chapter 1, that if you're a hearer only of the word and not a doer, you're in deception. If you come to church and you hear and don't practice out there, you are living deception. We should be more worried about that deception than about all the other stuff. By just doing, going through the motions of religion, hearing, 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 getting spiritually fat and never doing anything with it. That's deceiving. You're deceived because you think you're doing well by just putting in your time in church. No, you come to church to stretch out your muscles so you can go out there in the world and build them by activating your faith. That's where you grow your faith. One person gets it. So, the, if the Bible is a book of prophecies, think about this for a second. Why don't we focus more on prophecy? The Bible literally is a book of prophecies. Like, there's 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament, 578 in the New Testament, for a total of 1,817. Technically speaking, by one count, 27% of the entire Bible is predictive. So the focus of the book that we read is hyper-predictive and prophetic in nature, which should make a statement, we should be focusing more on what Paul said about, especially that you may prophesy. Now, I've taught this for, dec to, for over two decades now. I understand that people can get way off track. And I'm not advocating for getting off track. I'm advocating for balance. But man, sometimes we've, we've, like, we've just kind of left it. Like, we don't listen to Paul's words. Like Paul said, pursue love and eagerly, eagerly. Like, to burn, the negative is to burn with lust for. 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, eagerly desire, and then especially that you may prophesy. The Bible is a book of prophecies. At least one half of all biblical predictions have already been fulfilled precisely as God has declared. Isn't that amazing? We are living, we are watching prophecy unfold before our very eyes all the time. Not just biblical prophecy, but personal prophecy. I am watching personal prophecy in my own life unfold all the time. Unraveling like a ball of yarn all the time. I'm praying that you get something from this. I'm praying more than anything that you just receive like an encouragement and a strength to go after what God tells, tells you to go after. My mind is saying, give them the meat, but my spirit is saying, just share the stories. I do, I do want to share this with you. And I want to go to 2 Peter in a second here. I was going to take time to break down why Isaiah 60 is so important, but I'm not going to do that right now. And 59, the chapter, the whole chapter before, because one is about light, and one, or one is about darkness and chaos and struggle. One is about light. Arise and shine, for your light has come. It's predictive. It hasn't happened yet. Isaiah 60 has not happened yet. It directly relates to Revelation chapter 21. It speaks of the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth. We won't go there. But I do want to give you something this morning. How do you position yourself for the right time? Because we don't know the right time. We don't know the right time. If we don't know the right time, what can we do in the middle of that? Do we just walk around aimlessly? No, we have to position ourselves for at the right time. Think about, apply this to every area of your life that you're pressing in for right now, that you're pushing for, you're praying for. There's an at the right time moment. Number one, write this down. Remind yourself of God's words. That's one way that you can position yourself. Peter, first and second Peter, he wrote back to back. The first book of Peter, he wrote to a, um, an Asia Minor, a people from Rome. He's writing these books. He wrote from Rome to Asia Minor. He's encouraging the believers in the midst of managing crisis and trial and suffering. Then in the second, book, uh, the second book of Peter, he writes again because now the people are facing all this false teaching, all this heretical teaching, all this like just bad influence. And so he's directing them in the second letter against all of this stuff. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, this is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. Remember, it's about memory. Peter's like, I want to get you reminded of God's words. I want you to remember, remember what the holy prophets said long ago about what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Remember the prophecies. That's what he's saying. Remember the prophecies. Remember the words. Remember the promises. Remember what the holy prophets spoke. Verse 3. Most importantly, I want to remind you again. Say it again. I want to remind you. He's reminding us. He repeats himself, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promises that Jesus is coming again? It's been like thousands of years. From before the times of our ancestors, everything has been remained, has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command and brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But listen to this, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friend, dear friends. Don't forget, like remember, don't forget this one thing. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Timing in God is totally different than timing on earth. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day to God. Listen to this, such a key verse, verse 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people may think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He wants you to get ready. Now, this is speaking of the second coming. He wants you to get ready. The Lord 
when you feel like he's not answering your prayer, I want you to remember this verse. When you feel like things aren't coming the way you want them to come in your life and to your life. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as you may think. Because maybe you're saying to God, God, it's taking forever. He is being patient for your sake. He's preparing you because you're not ready. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to repent. And like if you're in the midst of a waiting season for something, like maybe there's something that you need to repent of. I don't know. Repentance is simply changing your perspective. Change your perspective. Like, like he's holding you back for your own benefit. Listen to what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. Solomon, wisest of all the land at the time writing this, in chapter 9, verse 11, he says this, Solomon, I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. And the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry, and the skillful are, skillful are not necessarily wealthy. Isn't that so true of life? And those, listen to this, who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance, by being in the right place at the what? At the right time. Everything is about at the right time. Let that sink in for a second. Like everything good that's God is always about at the right time. So be prepared. Get ready. Because when you get in the right room at the right time with the right people, everything can change. I don't know what this meeting did that I had on Tuesday. But maybe it was one of those at the right time moments to kickstart, to reignite this process again. At the right time, with the right people, in the right environment. You guys, listen, when you hyper focus on all of the things to get you through the God doors, you will miss it every time. If I just get this diploma, this degree, this PhD, this thing, then I'll do what I'm going to. No, I know so many people that have all that and are not doing what they're called to do. Because the God doors are not the good doors. The good doors you will open, the God doors only he will open. And the God doors will be opened when you find yourself in the right place at the right time. Because you've readied yourself in the process. Because you've had a predictive way of viewing the future. Because you're hearing and recognizing the voice of God for your future. Because you have a heart after what God says for the future. You can position yourself in the process and find yourself in the right place at the right time. Man, this is powerful. The, the word chance, some of you are like, what do you mean by chance? Like, this, like lottery? No, that's not what it means. It simply means occurrence, situation incident or event if you're just you find yourself at the right event in the right moment everything can change this is why community is so important this is why you need to get out of your shell of isolation and be with people because you're one person away from your breakthrough often you might meet the right person at the right time and everything changes you're looking for a job find community you might find the right person at the right time that opens the door for you whatever it is i don't know what it is for you I mean, how do you meet your spouse? Did you meet them? Maybe now online it's kind of screwing everything up, but you're on the right place at the right time on the right platform. <laughs> I don't know. But you got to be, you got to position yourself. Number two, write this down. Number, we'll close. Be ready. I've said it over and over again. Be ready. Remind yourself of the promises. Remind yourself of the word. The word says that at the right time. Be in the right place at the right time. Second point, I believe that we can position, second theme or second solution or key that we can, that we need to have in our lives to position ourselves for at the right time is be ready. Be ready. Like don't just sit around, be ready. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come what? Unexpectedly as a thief. Unexpected. The second return of, God, of Jesus will come, un you, won't, you, you, won't, you, won't, you won't know. There's no warning. No siren going off saying, okay, now you repent and do it now. No, be ready. The premise is be ready. Be ready. If you're ready, I was telling my son this last night, or uh, uh, yeah, yesterday. 
I've been trying to teach my, my son the drums. And I used to teach at a music school. I mean, like I was, that's what I was going to do with my life. I mean, I've taught many, 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 many kids over the years. And I was t- trying to teach them. Now, as a parent, teaching your kids, you know, musical instruments is not always easy. It's like teaching school to your kids. Lots of yelling goes on often. Um, but I, I'm trying, I said to him, I said, watch, you're going to get an opportunity one day and you won't be ready. I said, practice. I've been saying this for years to him. Practice. You have a kit in your house. You have somebody that did that. I can help you, like, steward the opportunity because at the right time, you're going to have an opportunity and you won't be ready. Well, let me just tell you what happened this week. Now he has an opportunity. He's saying, Daddy, you're, like, always right. I'm like, thank you, Lord. I'm like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> like, the greatest thing you can hear from your kids, Daddy, you're right. It's like the... It's like, I worship you, Jesus. (laughs) Be ready. Be ready. I'm going to close with Romans 5. I want you to stand up with me. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Paul writes, and he says this, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. He came right at the right time. Jesus paid the price for everybody in this room so that they would know him and be a part of his story. Listen, God's predicted your future. He knows your future. He's planned it already out. You're just part of his story. You can choose whether or not you want to live and be a part of that story and actually receive the benefits of that story. It's up to you. You have the choice. You have free will to choose and say yes. But he wants you part of his story. And the first step to be part of that story is just simply acknowledging that at the right time, Jesus came and died a sinless death on a cross, sacrificing his life for you and I so that we could have relationship with him. And I want to experience the most out of my relationship. I want to be known as a friend of God. You know, Abraham was known as a friend of God. God consulted Abraham when he was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because he was a friend. You know how he became a friend? Because he was willing to give up his dream. He was willing to give up Isaac. That's when everything changed for Abraham. Became a friend of God. A new part of his nature was, was conveyed when Abraham walked up to the mountain and about, was about to sacrifice Isaac. A ram came out of the thicket. And for the first time in Scripture, God introduced himself in a way he had never introduced himself before by saying, I am Jehovah Jireh. Because that was the acknowledgement of Abraham. You are Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. He saw a new side of God's nature. You know, there's new sides of God's nature he reveals to his friends. You could be part of church culture and have no grit of God's nature. You could be a born-again believer and be like Lot and have no idea you're about to be destroyed. But Abraham knew because he was a friend. Abraham was a friend of God. Lot was a born-again believer. Let's say it like that. A born-again believer. Lot had no idea what was about to happen, but Abraham did. I want to know what's about to happen. Because friends share secrets with friends. We see the future. I want to be known as a friend of God. And you're a friend, verse, chapter 15, verse 14, if you do what I command. This is the season you're in. Take the muzzle off. Take the mute button off and start to do what God's commanded you to do and be the example and ambassador in the marketplace and watch what God will reveal to you. Don't be like Lot and let yourself be destroyed because you choose to just go to church and not be the church everywhere you are. Everywhere you are. And it all starts with making a decision to letting Jesus in and acknowledging that he is Lord. He died on a cross to set you free from yourself, to set you free from your fear, to set you free from that sinful nature that binds you and enslaves you. And then he raised from the dead on the third day so you could be raised to new life and be given new life. That's the best decision. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. Everything will be different.
I want you to close your eyes just for a few moments. I believe God's going to speak to many of you in this room right now. He's going to speak to you. He's going to reveal some things to you in this moment. Maybe you're that one that's never said yes to Jesus fully. You're on the fence. Listen, here at Kingdom Culture, like, I, people, you know, people like going to a church where they're never challenged or confronted. A church where you're never challenged or confronted is a dangerous church. It's a James 1 church where, where you, you, you hear and you're just, it's okay that you don't apply what you're living. It's okay. That's deception. It's dangerous to come to a church and never be agitated. If you are never agitated in church, you are in a dangerous place. You should be encouraged. You should be confronted. You should feel conflicted inside. You should be like, man, I got to step up my game. If that's not what you think, you're probably in the wrong place. Because God is all about you growing and going. He wants you to grow. He wants you to be stretched. He wants you to expand and level up in this season. The ball is in your court. You, can, you, you have the ball. Start shooting. Start shooting the ball. See where it lands. You might just get a point. This is your challenge in this season. Shoot the ball at your workplace, in your meetings, in your corporate meetings. Ask God for heavenly wisdom. God, give me a dream about this meeting. Like, you don't know what God can do. If you position yourself, you get into the Word, and you're ready, you, will, you, you have no idea the God doors that will open to you. So Holy Spirit, I pray that right now your voice would be so strong. I pray that in this house you would raise up not only prophets in this house, but that you would raise up people that have a predictive way of seeing the future. 